Yeah. All right. Well, we have some football injury news. Never a good thing in the spring. Plus, we have a destination for TCU men's basketball in the NCAA tournament and for women's basketball in the WBIT. We'll talk about what that is and what's going on with baseball. They got swept by Oklahoma this weekend. We're going to dive into all of that right now on this episode of Frogs Insider. Let's go. Welcome in to another episode of Frogs Insider. Jamie Plunkett here alongside Melissa Trebwasser. Melissa, you are in a familiar yet unfamiliar space because you're doing your yeah. Kings thing again tonight. Yep. Once again, reporting from the bowels of the Golden One Center. Uh, tried to tried to catch up with Desmond Bain pregame, but he's coming back from an injury and did not did not get to see him. So hope hoping we'll have a little a little content from Des here post game to talk about on the next podcast. Would be nice. Would be nice to catch yeah. up with with old Desmond. That uh, yeah. What a great dude. What an absolute yeah, such great a good dude. dude. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's a little so basketball player too. Yeah. yeah you know. Yeah. He's all right. Got a got a nice little contract there huh, at the end of the day. Yeah. No big deal. Um, happy for him. Um, yeah, give it to Flying Tea Club Des. Anyways, moving right along. Uh, Frogs Insider Podcast. We are part of the Republic of Football Network, part of Dave Campbell's Texas Football. You can find the show wherever you get your podcasts. All you've got to do is search Republic of Football Network, and our feed will pop up. You'll get our show along with the show's of every other school in the state of Texas that has the D1 football program all right there in the same feed. So if you're interested in getting more info on other schools in the state, it's the perfect feed to subscribe to. If you only want TCU content, you can just search for Frogs Insider and our feed will pop up with just the TCU show. Uh, Make sure that you've liked and subscribed and do all of the fun things with that. Leave a comment on the YouTube channel as well. Continuing to grow. We got some really lovely comments from folks on the press conference of Jamie Dixon's from earlier this week talking about the tournament. Uh, and by lovely, I mean the opposite because YouTube is YouTube and comments are comments. These days. Yeah, don't um, read the comments. Never read yeah, the comments. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't actually leave a nice comment to offset all of the other ones. Let's just, there let's you just go. do that. Perfect. Let's just do that. We will, we will beg for um, you to like us. It's fine. A big thanks as well to Hell's Half Acre Stadium Goods uh, for sponsoring the show, as well as Home Field Apparel. Thank you to both of them. And Jamie, before before we we continue with that, I have to ask: Hell's Half Acre did a March Madness sale. Did you cop any new T-shirts? I didn't. I didn't this time around. Look, I was torn between doing that or doing the mystery shirt series from Home Field, and Top. In my head, I was like, eh, if I do one, I should probably do the other because they both sponsor the show. And I was like, I spent a lot of money on stuff recently and I like being married and I don't want to, you know, spend any more money right now. So I ended up not doing either. Um, but man, really good deal over at Health yeah. Baker and a really cool opportunity to get some surprise shirts from Home Field as well. So We'll talk a little bit about those later in the show, but right now, Melissa, we've got to start with the news that came down on Monday afternoon that TCU quarterback Josh Hoover will not be participating in spring camp because he has an injury uh, and he will be out until at least early summer. TCU is expecting that he will be back by summer, um, but there's no real, I mean, summer is a, a, a good amount of time, a um, couple of months in there in that in that season, and um, just not a great situation for a quarterback room that already had a lot of question marks this spring. Yeah, um, you know, before I give my opinion on Josh Hoover, I'm going to insert one other point of information. We're going to find out how good of a friend Jamie Plunkett is tonight because whilst I'm recording this podcast in the bowels of the Gold One Center, I'm also trying to eat my dinner. And it's going to be very obvious to Jamie when I am mid-bite. And so I'm going to be very interested to see how many times you try to trip me up with this awkwardly. So just, again, for a little peek behind the curtain for the folks at home. Um, Jamie, I, this is concerning. This is the second offseason in a row that we have gotten into spring ball and potentially eased like edged up to fall camp, not feeling great about the quarterback situation at TCU or the quarterback room. Um, You know, I think nobody was unhappy that Ken Seals was brought in. Um, Nobody is unhappy that Hassani is, you know, coming in as a true freshman, 
But once Josh Hoover misses any time, and you know we don't know the specifics of the surgery or the injury at this point, so it's hard to say is this something that's going to be lingering or is this going to be kind of a we just need to fix it and get it over with thing. Um, but it's certainly concerning to think about TCU going through spring with a true freshman and an experienced veteran, but but not a guy that I think many TCU fans were expecting to potentially take the reins as QB one from Josh Hoover. Um, and with injuries and young quarterbacks, you just don't know how they're going to respond. So it's concerning. Um, you hate to see a guy who's going into his first, potentially first full season as a starter, not go through spring with all of these new receivers and new running backs and new offensive line. Um, and it also kind of is disappointing because one of the things we talked about as being a real positive this year was the continuity. And now he's yeah. missing out on all of those reps and he's not experienced enough to not need the reps in the spring and not need spring ball. So um, it's, it's a bummer to put it simply, but it's also, I think it is a little bit concerning and it just, it, it kind of sets us up what we're once again, we're all kind of on the edge of our seats going, Oh no, is this going to be another situation like last year? Uh, that's the question that everybody on the board is asking right now, because you have uh, a situation currently where, Ken Seals and, and Haas Haney are the only two healthy scholarship quarterbacks on the roster. There are a couple of walk-ons there. And then that, obviously people's minds immediately go nowadays to, okay, well, uh, is there a portal opportunity? Not right now because the portal's not open right now. And so whoever's in the portal right now is in the portal. Maybe you go get somebody as another walk-on, as another arm uh, to, to try and just have the bodies out there to throw footballs around because beyond just getting reps in practice – you need multiple quarterbacks to do other things in practice, like throw footballs to multiple receivers at a time. Um, and so there, there's some questions about what the room is going to look like this spring with Josh Hoover not a part of it. Um, but like you said, I think you made a great point, Melissa. The, the biggest disappointment here is, is from the continuity standpoint. To say, uh, you know, this the first time, and I think we've said this on the show before, this is the first time since 2021, I believe, that the Frogs have had the same offensive coordinator two years in a row. And and Josh Hoover mentioned it's the first time in his college career where he's not having to learn a new playbook in the spring. And there was going to be so much opportunity this spring to get ahead of the game for once. For the first time, really, in the Sunny Dykes era, have an offense that people are coming into the program familiar with already. And now it's not going to happen because Josh Huber's not going to be there to get those first team reps. The question will be, are they going to bring in another quarterback to help compete? Uh, or the other question being, who is going to get the majority of those reps? Is it going to be Ken Seals? Is it going to be Haas Haney? My money would probably be on Haas Haney getting as many possible spring reps as he can just because this is your four-star kid from, from Alito who, you know, realistically, this is your guy. And this is an opportunity for him to get firmly and squarely established in Kendall Bryles' offense because if Josh Huber is dealing with injuries now, what happens when he starts getting hit in the fall? And if he's going to go down with an injury, you've got to have a guy who's at least moderately prepared. TCU was fortunate to have a guy who was moderately prepared last year when Chandler Morris went down. And even then, when Josh Hoover was in, there were still a lot of struggles adapting to the offense. Uh, the Frogs were only two and four in their final six games that Josh Hoover started. And so you know, just just not not the ideal situation for TCU from a quarterback standpoint right now. Yeah, I mean, as excited as we can all be about Haas Handy and as you know, thankful and appreciative we could be of Ken Seals and his experience, if either of those guys are starting over Josh Hoover against Stanford on – August 30th, then I think you have to reset your expectations for the season in a lot of ways. And coming off of a five and seven year, there's not, I mean, there's not a lot of leash. It doesn't feel like the fan base is is frustrated. They, I think they're hopeful, but now you kind of get this swift kick of the stomach and everybody goes, oh God, here we go again, because it's not for lack of trying, but TC didn't bring in a quarterback that I think most people expected to be able to compete with Josh Hoover legitimately. And then if the worst case scenario, Josh Hoover goes down, if Ken Seals starts a game or two, great. Like, I feel good about that. Plus Haiti has a package or two, you know, it is situationally being used great. But if one of those two guys is starting for your 12 games, 
you start to think, oh gosh, is this going to be five and seven, six and six, seven and six again? Or, you know, is there, is there something there that we have, that kids, Ken Seals has been relieved of having to play at Vanderbilt? Like, you know, will he look different in this system? But again, if you're trying to develop Haas in the spring, this is a completely foreign offense for Ken Seals too. And so you've got another guy you're trying to teach on the fly. It's just, it's not a good situation for TCU in any way, shape or form. And I think, you know, you wanted Sonny Dykes to learn from last year. And now we're sitting here looking at pretty much the exact same situation, thankfully in the spring and not in the fall, but where you have, you have a quarterback coming off of a massive injury and not a whole lot that you know behind him. Mm -hmm. And, and the challenge is, you know, if you, this is for any school that's trying to get depth in the portal, right? Because if a guy is in the portal, the likelihood is, is that he's not going somewhere to be a backup and TCU for better or for worse has enough faith in Josh Hoover to look quarterbacks in the eye in the portal and say, we've got our guy. We need the guy behind the guy. And whether you agree with that tactic or not, I personally, I'm, I give credit to TCU's coaching staff for not lying to kids in the portal and saying, yeah, it'll be an open competition. Come in and try your best. And then when they get on campus, all will Josh is the dude. Um, so props in that regard and good on Ken seals for taking the opportunity when he kind of had an understanding of, of what the situation was going to be. But when you approach the portal in that way, it's, it starts to become a challenge to get the depth necessary to sustain a program in the face of, an injury like this. And like you said, it's a good thing that's happening in the spring and not the fall, but nonetheless, uh, you know, we just witnessed what an injury can do at the quarterback position in the last two seasons. One of those times you had Max Duggan in the wings. That was really great. The other time you had a retro freshman who maybe wasn't quite ready, but played admirably down the stretch. And that, you know, what do you have this year? Well, we just, we just kind of talked about it. So not, not an ideal situation. Well, let me ask you this question. I think you brought up a great point is that part of the reason TCU has not been able to, you know, for, and I, uh, um, to bring in a high big name quarterback is because they've kind of ridden with um, Josh Hoover's starter. But now that there's this injury and again, without really knowing the severity of it or the circumstance of it, it's hard to say, but can you approach that the same way heading into, into the next transfer window? Because at this point, do we know that Josh Hoover is going to be hundred percent in the fall? Do we know that he's going to be healthy enough to be guaranteed the starting job? Or do you say, Hey, we have our presumed starter, but he's coming off of whatever this injury ends up being. There's going to be a better opportunity to compete because there's going to be a ton of quality quarterbacks in the portal after spring football, right? Like we see that every year, there's plenty of guys that, and then now that they can transfer twice, you're going to have some of these veterans like a, like a Spencer Sanders from last year, right? Who goes to a situation, they end up signing every quarterback under the sun. And now if he had had the opportunity, he probably would have gone elsewhere. Um, but are you going to have a guy like that? And are you going to be willing to say, hey, you can come in and you can compete. We're, we're trying to ride with Josh, but at this point, we don't know what we've got in this kid based on his health or, or lack thereof. So, I mean, I'll be interested to see if Sunday Dykes changes his strategy at the next portal window, or if they continue to say, no, we, we aren't going to go after a big money big name, big star experience guy, because we want Josh to be healthy and be our quarterback on August 1st or whatever camp opens. You know, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I see both sides of this argument. I really truly do. And uh, it's, it's a little window into just how complex and challenging roster management is these days at the collegiate level. Um, because you're also talking about still having a scholarship limit and news broke last week that TCU has an open scholarship now because Tommy Brockemeyer medically retired. Um, and, uh, you know, what are you going to do with that one scholarship? Because that was a, that was a tackle. So are you going to go get another offensive lineman? Or are you going to use that scholarship to get a backup quarterback now? And so uh, the questions are, are multiple, I think for Sonny and his staff to try and figure out a solution to, uh, kind of the couple injuries that have cropped up in the last few weeks for, for the team. But Melissa, regardless of the complexities of roster management and the transfer portal, one thing that is 
abundantly clear and straightforward is that every time you go to hellshalfacresg.com, you're going to see a ton of different things that you want to buy. The only complexity there is how much you're going to spend and how many things you're going to get at one time from Hell's Half Acre Stadium Goods. Because frankly, every time I go over to the website, there's something new and there's something that I want. And it's really a challenge for me to not spend all of my money over there because they've got such great stuff. Well, you know what? There hasn't been recently any new sweep shirts, but <sighs> that's fine. It's neither here nor there. Tough um, one. But I did, I did, I did pick up a couple of t-shirts during the March Madness sale. I'm very excited. Everything I've ordered from Hell's Half Acre has been great quality, super comfortable, just really, really well made stuff. So, um, like we always say, we want to support the people that are supporting TCU, and Hell's Half Acre is an outstanding supporter of TCU athletics, um, TCU student athletes and, and TCU families. So um, you will have no regrets. I'm sure they'll be doing some fun stuff during March Madness. And of course, uh, throughout the continuation of baseball se season, no one is doing more baseball specific gear than Hell's yeah. Half Acre, which is really, really cool. Even though we're not, none of us are like particularly happy with baseball right now, that's still a program that we love to support that deserves some personalized swag. And there's quite a bit coming out of Hell's Half Acre. I think there's going to be a sweep shirt here pretty soon. But we'll talk about that when we get to the baseball segment of the show. Melissa, right now we've got to talk hoops because it's yeah. tournament time. It's frankly the best four days of, of the basketball year are coming up this week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament. And TCU, nine seed in Indianapolis. They're in the Midwest region. They have a first round draw against eight seed Utah State, which feeds in to a one seed matchup potentially. With Purdue, you never know with the Boilermakers. They're going to make yeah. it out of the first round as a one seed. But Purdue and Zach Eady, the leading scorer in college basketball this year, an absolutely just wildly talented seven-footer. But this Utah State matchup, Melissa, um, let's we can dive into it here in a second. I've been working on a preview for Utah State. But give me your initial reactions to – TCU being a nine seed, because I know that there were some other projections that had them at an eight. There were projections that had them as a 10 in Dayton. It was kind of all over the map for the Horned Frogs. Well, listen, if you're going to be an eight, nine, you'd rather be a nine, right? Because because more than 50% of the time, there's an upset, you know, with the underdog, the lower seed wins that eight, nine matchup. I mean, as far as the, the number one seed that you could be paired up with, uh, it's not the worst. Um, you know, I think I, I'm a lot more afraid of Purdue than a lot of the TCU fan base seems to be. Um, I, I do think that there are some favorable matchups in that instance for TCU, but I also, I, I think Zach Eady could have 75 points um, and foul out our entire front line, um, which might not be enough to win, but, but he's certainly capable of that, especially with the way that he's officiated in college basketball. But all things considered, I, I think it was fair. Like, I, I don't really think we have a whole lot of room to argue with the committee's placement of TCU, where they placed them in the back bracket, where they slotted them, who they slotted them against. Um, Frogs had plenty of opportunities to to raise their seed and, and had winnable games, especially winnable home games that, that probably could have gotten them to that 6-7 line. And when you look at the way the rest of the Big 12 was slotted, I think a nine is about about right for TCU. So I, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't disappointed. I wasn't worried at all going into um, into the selection show that TCU wouldn't make the tournament. Um, and, and I felt like it was a pretty a pretty accurate positioning that they did for the Horned Frogs. I agree with you there. I think that uh, nine is, is appropriate for how the season went. Um, it was it was interesting because I was sitting at the basketball game or at the baseball game on Saturday as the frogs were playing Oklahoma and one of the Oklahoma 24 seven guys came down uh, for the series. And so we're sitting there in the press box watching baseball happen and he's watching hoops on his phone. And he's like, all right, we need such and such Oklahoma needs such and such to win today so that so-and-so doesn't steal a bid. And he's listing all of these games and every single game he lists the bid stealer wins the game. And so he's sitting there like, I don't think Oklahoma's going to get in. I don't, there's no shot with all of these bid stealers that OU's going to get in. And in my head, I'm thinking, I know TCU is pretty safe, but are these bid stealers going to force them to Dayton and have to play in a play in game? Because, you know, uh, JMU is winning the conference and Duquesne and UAB are winning their conferences. 
And uh, it ended up obviously not being that way for TCU. TCU got their nine seed. Oklahoma was the first team out, or we would have had nine Big 12 teams in the conference this year or in the tournament this year. But um, for for TCU, you know, I, I, I like this matchup with um, Utah State. But Utah State has a guy who reminds me a lot of Jawan Roberts from Houston. His name's Great Osabor. He's a 6'8", 250-pound forward who averages 18 points a game, over nine rebounds a game, and he, he plays 34 minutes a game. Like The guy is an absolute warrior. He started all 33 games for them this year, and his shooting percentage, Melissa, 58.3%, 27th in the country. Like He is so good uh, down low in the block, um, and uh, I'm, I'll be very curious to see how TCU's front court handles a guy as athletic and as big as him uh, for essentially the entire game because he's going to play pretty much the entire game. Well, yeah, this is this is where we have to see. Like, I don't care how many points Ernest Uday scores or doesn't score against Utah State. He needs to earn his money just trying to be a presence in the paint. You know, if he can block a shot or two, if he can just take up space, if he can be a great defensive rebounder and keep – Utah State from getting easy looks. I mean, if you're shooting nearly 60% from the floor, I'm imagining the vast majority of those shots are coming from within eight feet. So this is mm-hmm. a guy who obviously understands how to create position, maintain position. I'm going to guess he's also a pretty efficient offensive rebounder. I'm trying to look at his numbers right now, too. Yeah, I mean, he's got a third of his off- a third of his rebounds come on the offensive end of the, of the floor. So um, that's – and that's something where I think TC started out the season so strong. Um, rebounding wise and it was mm-hmm. something that really fell off for them down the stretch. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, this, I've, I've heard a lot of people kind of compare this Utah state team to BYU. I don't think they're as prolific from the three point line as the Cougars have been the last month or so of the season. Um, but I don't think BYU has anybody like great Osibor. So um, it, it's TCU's favored. I think they should be favored. Um, but I, I I don't think that Utah State obviously is going to roll over and die here. They've won a ton of games. Um, you know, people are going to kind of nitpick their schedule. That's fine. Um, I think that's fair as well. I, I've, I've seen a couple places mention that they have yet to play a Power 5 team this year. But the Mountain West Conference was pretty dang solid conference. I mean, you've got Nevada that took TCU to the woodshed. You've got San Diego State was in the final court. Jaden Ledee might be one of the, the – I've heard him called one of the five best players in college basketball this year, which is oh, what could have been. Yeah, I mean, that might be a little we'll bit see. of a – yeah, but, yeah. But, but he's putting up – I mean, he, he's, you know, Chuck O'Bannon's age, but he is putting up pretty pretty ex- exceptional stats. Like Jaden Liddy is actually really – fun fact. Team. Fun fact, Jaden Liddy is younger than Chuck O'Bannon. Okay, I, 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 f- I figure, but, you know, <laughs> not by much. Um, not by much. Uh, I, I think the, the Power 5 comment, I think – I've because I've, I've heard people say that too. Oh, they haven't played a Power Five team. Well, they're four. I mean, they're four and five against Quad One opponents this year, yeah. and that's kind of the metric that you really start to look at. They only have one fewer Quad One wins than TCU does. Yeah. Uh, TCU is five and eleven Quad One. Utah State is four and five in Quad One, um, and so they have played a lot of those good games. They've beaten San Diego State this year. They've beaten Nevada this year, and so uh, they they have um, some really good wins under their belt, like you were saying. But I think. What I really appreciate about this this Utah State team and with all these Mountain West teams that you kind of mentioned, let's say, is that I think they're all going to enter the tournament with a chip on their shoulder because yeah. the disrespect that the Mountain West got from a seeding standpoint was pretty significant. Everybody that I saw had Utah State projected as a six or a seven seed. They wind up as an eight. Everybody I saw had New Mexico on the nine, 10 line, and they ended up as an 11. Always, uh, you know, you've got... Colorado State in the play-in. You've got yeah, uh, which is insane, right? And so you've got some of these, but then you know you've got like an FAU from the American getting the benefit of the doubt for last year's run and becoming an eight seed, which is pretty mighty ridiculous if you do ask me. And so I think that Utah State is going to come in with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder to say we probably supposed to be a higher seed. We're going to show you why we think that. Uh, in this first round game against TCU. And so I'm really looking forward to this matchup because I think Utah State's going to be fired up. And just from talking to to some of the players on Sunday afternoon, we got to sit down with Micah uh, and E-Man and Jacoby for a couple of minutes after the selection show. All, all those guys, I mean, and you could see it on the video I posted on Twitter. 
they were they're like okay like it's time to get back to work you know the first year that those three guys were on campus and we did the selection show thing the whole team was standing up they were jumping around they were hyped they were excited they were ready last year was more the same like yeah we're going back two years in a row it's pretty dope this year is like okay great cool we're in now let's go it's time to go get go get back to work and all three of those guys sat at that table after the game or after the show on Sunday and said, yeah, like we're excited. We're excited about it. Utah state. We're going to learn a lot about them this week, but this is, this is the year we have to get past weekend one. They know, they know the task at hand is to get further than they've gotten the last two years. They're like, we want this win. And then we want the opportunity to get beyond the second game of the tournament. And I like that mentality and that focus from them. Um, We'll see how that manifests on the court this weekend. Well, yeah, and I mean, that's the thing that I think has been frustrating the last couple of weeks is it seems like there's been some moments of lack of focus. You know, when you have those four and five minute scoreless stretches in each of the halves, it, that feels like a focus thing. And so you want to see those guys locked in and be ready. But at the end of the day, they're going to have to prove it on the court because, I mean, you said it, Utah State has a much bigger chip on their shoulder at this point than TCU does. Um, and they are a really good team. They're a veteran team. They've got experience. And TCU has not consistently shown that they can play at their highest possible level. So if you kind of blink here, then then the Aggies will run away from you. I mean, for sure, like that would not be out of the question. Um, but TCU is well positioned to win an opening game for the third year in a row, not just make the tournament, but win a game. Um, and, you know, that the, the Purdue matchup would be hairy. I mean, it, it would be, it, I would, I would have some concerns, but um, it's not like Purdue hasn't blown a tournament game in recent history. So if, if you want a vulnerable, vulnerable one seed, that's probably your most vulnerable one seed. And we know historically one of those one seeds is not going to make it to the sweet 16. So it, TCU's got a path in front of them. That's not impossible. Um, it's not overly favorable, but I think, like I said earlier, I think it's fair. So now it's going to be up to them to take advantage of their opportunity and, and show that the team that plays at its highest level is a team that uh, we, the, the first month of the season, we thought this team could be the team that made the sweet 16. They can get back to that regardless of the opponent. Yeah. A couple other notes about Utah state and TCU. They're pretty similar as far as pace goes they're right at 72 73 possessions per 40 minutes for for the season so both teams move the ball pretty consistently tcu obviously though the best team in the country when it comes to fast break points at almost 19 points per game the pace doesn't translate to fast break points for utah state quite as often there are there are about 10 11 fast break points per game and another thing too is that their turnover margin isn't very impressive they're 205th in the country in turnover margin, Melissa, just 0.8. Uh, so they turn it over uh, roughly 16 times a game. Um, they force a good number of turnovers as well. Um, and then their assist to turnover ratio is actually one of the better ones in the country, though, um, where it's about 1.47 assist to turnover ratio. Just for some context there, Houston is 1.46. And Iowa State is 1.48. So you're talking about the two best turnover ratios in the Big 12. Utah State is kind of right in the mix there at that number. Competition-wise, we can talk about all of that and say, oh, it's not quite apples to apples. Well, for all intents and purposes, it is. And uh, Utah Utah State has shown that, A, they're very good at distributing the ball. Uh, B, they do their best to minimize turnovers. Uh, And uh, C, they like to get out. They like to move quickly uh, up and down the court, even though that doesn't translate to fast break points necessarily. So I think we'll see Utah State try to go quickly in their half court sets. They're not going to wait around. They're not going to dribble the ball a ton. You're going to see a lot of ball movement, a lot of inside out because they've got um, Osobo, like we mentioned already, but they've also got a guy, Darius Brown, the second who averages over 12 points a game. He's shooting about 39 and a half percent from three point range. He averages six and a half assists per game and four and a half rebounds per game. So he's a six, two guard, both Osobo and, and Brown, by the way, were teammates at Montana state last year. They transferred to Utah State together, uh, and they've been absolutely tearing it up for um, for the Aggies. So uh, another thing, too, this Darius Brown kid, uh, he was the 2023 Big Sky Defensive Player of the Year. Um, he averaged, I think, two and a half steals per game last year. He's a little less than that, one, 1.7-ish steals per game this year. He's played almost 1,200 minutes, Melissa, which is more than any TCU player has played this year. It's only been called for 45 fouls. Wow. That's so insane. 
Yeah, averaging 36 minutes a game, he's been called for 45 fouls all season. So that tells you the kind of defender that he is and how capable he is of turning guys over without committing fouls. So it'll be really interesting to see how Brown handles Jameer Nelson Jr. and Avery Anderson because he's a little bit smaller than both of those guys. He's only about six foot two. So those those kind of perimeter matchups are something that I'm really looking forward to about this game as well, just to see how does TCU handle Osibor defensively down low, and then how do they respond to the defense of Darius Brown out on the perimeter? I think those are going to be two kind of in-the-game matchups that, that are going to be really interesting to watch. Yeah, it's a, it should be a really fun game. It should be an entertaining game. You've got two elite defenders on either side. Um, you know, I, I think it's – this is what you want, right? This is this is what March is all about. So TCU has an opportunity. That's all you could ask for. It's going to be up to Jamie Dixon to have his guys ready, and it's really mm-hmm. going to be up to his guys to execute the game plan. Um, and that's that has been the big question mark over the last couple weeks of the season. So um, I'm excited. Uh, I'll be on pins and needles. I've got a nice Friday night slot. Um, so just an opportunity to uh, have all eyes on you, and and we'll see uh, we'll see what they do with it. 9.55 local time, 8.55 central time, tip off on Friday night between TCU and Utah State. Very excited to see the first round of that tournament game. But what's happening the day before, Melissa, is something that hasn't happened at TCU in quite a while. Because on Thursday night, yes. TCU women are going to be playing in a postseason basketball game that I'm very much looking forward to. This one's at TCU against the University of North Texas in the newly minted Women's Basketball Invitational Tournament, the WBIT. Uh, which is kind of the NCAA's secondary tournament for the folks that don't get into the NCAA. It is considered the second tier tournament behind the NCAA tournament now, forcing the WNIT kind of down into that third tier of tournament. So a little bit of a shuffle on the tournament side for, for women's hoops this year. I think something similar might be coming for men's basketball down the road as well. Mm -hmm after we've seen kind of the chaos of the NIT and rejections of invites and the way that they restructure that thing, which was foolish on the W or which was foolish on the NIT's part to, to guarantee, to take away some guarantees to mid majors that they, that they had previously. But anyways, new 32 team tournament, the WBIT TC women's basketball starts by hosting UNT on Thursday night. Pretty cool that in year one, with all of the chaos, with all of the injuries, that TCU is still going to be playing some post postseason basketball. Yeah, I, I think it's awesome. And I think too that this team, nobody in all of NCAA sports needed some time off more than TCU women's basketball. I mean, they had people return to the lineup, but not probably at hundred percent health. Madison Connor obviously was laboring the last couple games that, that she got back in. So this team not fully healthy, not even remotely close to fully healthy, but this team a little bit rested, a little bit more healthy um, with with something to play for, I think could absolutely make a deep run in this tournament. Um, and, you know, just an opportunity for TCU fans to get to watch Sedona Prince play a couple more games, hopefully a few, several more games possibly, um, and to get to just kind of get their support behind. And we talked about it, I think, um, last episode that, you know, that 2017 NIP championship by TC men's basketball really launched that program into being an annual or semi-annual term tournament team i think that this tournament could do the same exact thing for mark campbell um just stringing together wins coming off of um that that terrible stretch of injury luck and the the losses that came alongside of it this is going to be a great opportunity for him to remind people why he is the the perfect coach for this program and what he's capable of doing when he has something resembling close to a full roster so i'm excited to watch them play i love these tournaments give us the local kind of matchups. Um, TCU doesn't play UNT in hardly anything almost ever. So that's really, really exciting. Um, and I think they've got a, a pretty decent draw in order to make a run here if, if they can get some get some people back on track. I, I fully agree. Really excited to see them play some postseason basketball and hopefully it goes well for the Horn Frogs. Um, Melissa, as we kind of shift into our final top t- topic here, I do want to just shout out uh, Home Field Apparel. You can go to homefieldapparel.com and use the code FROGS in 15. That's FROGS IN15 to get 15% off of your first purchase. They've got an entire section of TCU related gear that is absolutely incredible. Um, so go and use the code FROGS in 15 to get 15% off your first purchase. Use it again and you'll get 10% because you get 10% off of the second purchase and all subsequent purchases after that. 
and they have something I think pretty much every week um, during the tournament yeah. that they release, whether it's for the street t-shirts or, or special shirts or everything. So definitely keep your eye on home field apparel. Hey, maybe if PC makes a sweet 16, maybe we'll get a special March Madness shirt for, for making history. It would be pretty great. It would be pretty, would be pretty great. awesome. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Baseball, still baseball <laughs> a little stinky, a little stinky. Um, baseball got swept by Oklahoma this weekend in Fort Worth. Uh, interesting weekend of baseball games. Let's let's back up though, because they did beat a really talented DBU team in the mm-hmm. midweek last week, nine to four over in Dallas. Uh, Louis Rodriguez gave you three and two thirds innings of damn good pitching, seven strikeouts, yeah. sixty one pitches. Uh, did everything you needed him to do. As he just kind of shoved for three three point two innings um, to help TCU get a bigger lead and then hold on to that lead late. Um, but they came into the weekend, you know, having dropped that first weekend series to Kansas State, feeling like, all right, well, we're back at home. Uh, the SOU team is a good team, but we kind of maybe woke up a little bit on Sunday against Kansas and on Tuesday against DBU. Let's uh, let's get this machine rolling like it was the first couple of weeks of the season. And it just didn't happen. It was inconsistent batting, uh, a lot of pressing in the field, a lot of in- interesting decision making beyond just errors which there were several errors that normally don't get made by guys like Anthony Silva and Peyton Chatagnier. Yeah. Um, but decision-making was interesting too. There were moments where it felt like guys felt like they had to make a big play instead of making the right play with the mm-hmm. baseball. And you saw that in the form of guys trying to get lead runners out on ground balls where 95% of the time you're supposed to just take the out at first and move on. And those situations ended up with more runners on base and no outs recorded. And I think there's some, this is a trend that I've been noticing this year. And I wrote about it a little bit in the Monday manager this week on Horn Frog Blitz. And I want to bounce it off of you, Melissa. I think that part of this frustrations with TCU starting pitching this year actually originate in the fielding, keeping pitchers out for longer earlier in games than they should be because the past four games, TCU pitching has allowed 2.3 runs per start, earned runs per start. That number jumps to 3.3 total runs per start when you include all of the unearned runs that TCU has given up over the last four games. And so there have been some flaws in the defense that I think are causing some of the length issues that we're seeing from TCU starting rotation. Um which has been a focal point of TCU fans' frustration so far this year, the fact that TCU is not pitching deep into games. Well, I think there's not a sport that has more karmic retribution attached to it than baseball, right? And how many times have we seen an error or a leadoff walk or, you know, some of those unforced Mm -hmm. mistakes come around and get an extra guy up who hits a home run, you know, like that, that's just seems that's the way baseball go. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I think for the other thing is if you're a pitcher and you're already like kind of struggling and you see, like, I don't want to pick on anybody, but you see a, a base hit become a double because of a little momentary lapse of, of concentration in the outfield, or you see, you know, a, a, a ball get thrown to the wrong base by, by a shortstop who knows better or second baseman who's, you know, been around baseball for a long time like those kind of things get in your head and pitchers already frankly had cases right so yeah you can't hey (laughs) let's be honest all right Um, it's not untrue um but yeah so so when you're a pitcher and you've gotten your first two outs and then you think you've got out number three and all of a sudden now there's Mm -hmm. a guy standing on second base that wasn't supposed to be there uh, i i think that that can definitely play with you especially when the entire team is struggling and like you said everybody's pressing so as a pitcher you start to press and what becomes, you know, a one base error now becomes a home run ball, mm-hmm. you know, or, or a couple walks get strung together. You hit somebody. Um, and, and when every, like the wheels have certainly been spinning and they are starting to come off for TCU baseball, we've been here before. Like I, I, I tweeted about this. It's just March. I try to remind myself it's just March. Um, but it is, it is concerning to see the same concerns this time of year annually. That might just be the way that college baseball is these days. Um, but uh, I, I definitely, 
I definitely have reason for concern. I think it's I think it's fair to to be one in five in the Big Twelve. I think it's fair to be concerned as a fan and to not like what you're seeing. The real question is going to be: Kirk Charles was able to flip the script last year. What is he going to do to do so again this year? And how often do you want to live on that razor's edge before you figure it out? Yeah, it's. It, I mean, I, I wrote about it today. I'm I'm still. I'm still not worried. I'm still not concerned about this team because I think at the end of the day, over the course of a season, as long as baseball has talent tends to bear out and it tends to, to, it tends to, to settle right where talent's supposed to settle when you have 54 games worth of opportunities to show how talented you are. Um, And so the reality is, is that yes, they are one in five in big 12 play. They're dead last in the conference right now. And that sucks. They're 15 and five overall. Um, but here's another reality for you. Wake Forest was the consensus number one team coming into the season. They have a losing record in the ACC right now. LSU was the consensus number two team coming into the season. They have a losing record in SEC play right now. It is far too early for people to get overly worried and start sounding the alarms about some of these teams that have top end talent at the collegiate level. And while yes, LSU and Wake Forest are wide, wildly talented and are probably two of the few programs in the country where you can definitively say they have more talent than TCU. TCU is one of the most talented programs in the country. They have first round talent on the roster that plays every day. They have kids who are here as true freshmen who were drafted, who chose to come to school instead, right? They have the talent needed to win 40 plus baseball games in a season. And the reality is, is that even the best players in baseball in the world go through slumps sometimes. And sometimes you slump as a team and it looks really bad on a weekend like it did this weekend for TCU. We saw something similar last year in West Virginia. That was actually, frankly, I think worse of a weekend series up in Morgantown than TCU had this weekend. And so, uh, yeah, it's not great baseball to watch right now. Yes, the guys are pressing and mistakes compound in baseball as bad as any other sport, if not worse. I still think it's only at the time of recording this 859 on Monday, March 18th. And there's there's I mean, we're barely a third of the way through the season. So uh, I think there's so much time left for this team to to course correct. And and I think they will. I, I just they're too talented not to. Will they course correct all the way back to Omaha? Will they course correct to a regular season Big 12 championship? I'm not sure. It's going to be really hard to chase down a 6-0 and Oklahoma from a 1-5 and spot that you're in after losing three games to them. But it's not unheard of. And it's not unheard of to still get in the mix for a really good seed in the tournament and then go on a run and win that thing. Um, we know that because we have evidence of it just from last year. So – not worried about TC baseball, even though it is frustrating to see them kind of shoot themselves in the foot over and over again. Um, and also props to Oklahoma because they came out and they played some really clean yeah. baseball all weekend, which makes the style of baseball that TC was playing look maybe even worse than, than it actually was. Yeah, o- Oklahoma was great. Oklahoma earned all three mm-hmm. of those wins. Um, I-, I definitely, my level of concern is a little bit higher than yours, but I'm also not around the team as much as you are, and you know those guys and you know their character. Um, I'm going to be really interested to see who's going to be this year's Trey Richardson, who's going to be the guy that kind of kind of grabs this team and pulls them out of their funk, like like he seemed to really do a lot mm-hmm. of of last year with his energy and his his infectiousness. Um, so it's too early to to give up hope by any stretch of the imagination. You made great points on all that. I, I will let's like say like on a scale of one to ten, my concern level is probably like at a four and a half right now. Um, now, if if we're having the same conversation two weeks from now, then it probably ratchets up to like a seven or eight. Like at some point, I, I think you're right that there's plenty of reasons to trust the talent on this team, but the season gets shorter every single game that they play. And so, you know, at some point that talent has to bear out. Um, I don't know, based on the the conference start this year, that you can turn it on as late as they did last year and be okay. You'd really like to see this thing kind of coming together by the end of the month, the beginning of April. Um, I, I don't know that you can try to get hot, you know, a couple of weeks leading into the Big 12 tournament and carry it out like they did last year. I don't know if that's going to work. Yet. They might. I mean, who knows? It, the talent's certainly there for that. But um it's you know every week that passes 
it becomes a little bit harder for me to say, I'm not worried yet. Um, but I, so right now I'm, it's March 18th. Like you mm-hmm. said, it is March 18th. We, we are not in a position to, to be overly concerned about this season. If we're having the same conversation on April 18th, then I think obviously it's a completely different scenario. We'll definitely be a little bit of a different tenor at that point if, if yeah. things are still going south. Uh, one last stat to leave you with, Melissa, before we wrap up the show tonight, and that is TCU's committed 20 errors this year through 20 baseball games. They committed 54 in, uh, I believe it's 68 baseball games mm-hmm. last year. Okay. But how many errors did they commit through the first 20 games of last season? That'd be 25. And then okay. they only committed 29 the rest of the way through the last 48 games of the year. So like, like I said, early season returns have been some of what we've expected, have been some of what we haven't quite expected. And yet there is still so much baseball left to be played. Yeah, still a really young starting yeah. lineup too. Oh my gosh, yeah. Half the time they've got three true freshmen in the lineup plus two sophomores. Yes, very, very talented yeah. freshmen and sophomores, but still freshmen and sophomores. So they're learning the game. They're they're adjusting to, to this level of baseball in a lot of ways. Um, just like we're adjusting to podcasting still after 10 years of doing it. So Yeah, it's a, every day is a new adventure. Mm-hmm. All right, Melissa, I think that's going to do it, though, for this episode of Frogs Insider. You've got a Kings-Grizzlies game to catch, and I've got to start editing this show. So... If you have been listening to this point, thank you so much for doing so. We really, truly appreciate it. Hit that subscribe button, whether it's on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating and review. Cancel out some of the negative comments about the coaching at TCU on all of our YouTube videos by leaving a positive one and affirming some of the people at TCU who provide uh, the wonderful coaching that we see top to bottom across all of the athletics at Texas Christian University. Anyways, we're rambling. We're going to get out of here. Until next time, go Frogs. Go Frogs.